So today, Dr. Scholz, we're talking about a rising PSA after someone has had surgery. Many of the viewers have had surgery and we just wanted to cover this topic so that they know the next steps and also what to expect after surgery and kind of the whole concept of how PSA works in this atmosphere. PSA is a really good measure for people of head surgery because we don't have any background noise from the residual prostate gland. This is something we deal with with radiation patients. They still have their prostates and they'll get a little background noise. But surgery, the slate should be clear and typically that means that the PSA will be continually below 0.1 indefinitely if you're cured. There are some exceptions to that in people that are cured. Sometimes the surgeons will leave a little bit of prostate tissue behind and we've had patients that have moseyed along with PSAs of 0.1, 0.2 interminably year after year after year, and we know that it's not cancer because it isn't going up. The good thing about PSA after surgery is that if the PSA is low and stable at 0.12 or if it's undetectable as it is many times, you can be 100% sure there's no prostate cancer uh, lurking somewhere that's gonna spring up and create a problem. Uh, we don't really have that luxury with any other type of cancer where we have a, a test that is that accurate and that consistent. I've never seen anyone run into progressive prostate cancer with an undetectable PSA. So what should the timeline be after surgery that one can expect? If someone goes into surgery with a PSA of 10, they say it'll take a month or two for the PSA to get totally out of your bloodstream. So we wait a, uh, you know, 60 days before you check the PSA, but it should be undetectable. Uh, a couple months after the operation. And then, of course, if there's detectable PSA, the next step is to check it frequently and see how quickly it's rising. Uh, we call that the PSA doubling time. And PSA doubling times are not that useful in people that have prostate glands because you have so much background noise from prostatitis and BPH. But with no prostate present, PSA doubling times will give you a, one of the best indications of how serious the situation is. Uh, Doubling times that take more than a year are associated with indolent processes that maybe don't even need treatment. Doubling times that are in the order of two or three months are the more consequential and worrisome types of prostate cancer, and then you have everything in between. I hope you're finding this video informative. I just wanted to take a quick minute to remind you that we are a 501c3 nonprofit and all of the videos that are on this channel are free because of people who have donated. So if you would like to join our cause and help us produce these videos and get the word out about them, you can help us by donating at pcri.org. Now, back to this video on a rising PSA after surgery. So let's say there is a rising PSA 60 days after surgery. Does this necessarily mean that maybe there's metastatic cancer? Was there some tissue left behind? What would be the cause and how would you determine that? So in the old days, we would do these algorithms and people that had very slow doubling times, let's say eight, nine, 10 month doubling times, we would tend to lean towards the possibility that the cancer is still where the prostate used to be in the, in the fossa. We'd also look at the Gleason score and patients with lower Gleason scores like sevens, as opposed to eight, nines, or tens, more likely that the cancer is still where the prostate used to be in the fossa. And uh, then the converse would be if the PSA was rising more quickly, or if people patients had a higher Gleason score to start with, or a higher PSA to start with. Let's say they went into surgery with a PSA of 20, then the assumption uh, would be leaning more toward the possibility of metastatic disease, perhaps in the lymph nodes. And all we could do is guess and use these metrics to try and guess right. Now we have PSMA PET scans, and it raises an a interesting conundrum. Uh, we know that PET scans will show some cancer somewhere in about 20% of men with a PSA of 0.2, maybe 50% of men with a PSA of 0.5, and maybe 90% of men with a PSA of one or so. So if someone has a PSA of 0.2 or 0.3 and their PSMA PET scan doesn't show anything, should we radiate where the prostate used to be, which is the traditional approach, or should we wait a while and, and see if we can find it as the PSA goes higher and then radiate the target when we find it on the scan? And there aren't any studies right now to give us clear guidance in this regard. The challenging issue is associated with the fact that radiation can have side effects in men that have had previous surgery. If they um, uh, have some incontinence already, it could get worse. If they have some imp impotence already from the surgery, it could get worse. And if there's no disease where the prostate used to be, let's say it's only in a lymph node, we find out later, 
then uh, the radiation is far less dangerous. Radiation to a lymph node doesn't cause impotence or incontinence. It's only when they radiate the fossa, right where the prostate used to be. There is no uh, stipulated formula as of 2023 uh, whether we should jump in and as a precaution just radiate even if the PSMA PET scan is negative. There are studies showing that if you give radiation before the PSA goes above 0.5, that you have better long-term cure rates uh, compared to the men that have radiation treatment at over 0.5. Uh, that's just a generality. Don't say that that's the be-all to end-all. But it does show that there's a little pressure in this decision as to should we do radiation right away with a slightly better cure rate or should we postpone it and keep doing PSMA PET scans and uh, possibly uh, have a scenario where we don't have to radiate where the prostate used to be if we don't find any disease there. So how do you help patients determine between which one to choose? I mean, it seems like if they're already experiencing side effects from the surgery and the concept that those side effects could get worse, that could be a pretty extensive situation. But then the concept of it actually may be more effective to have the radiation right away. That seems like you're kind of a bit of a crossroads. Is it a quality of life issue? What are the determining factors? How, how well is the person recovered from surgery? Are they younger or older? Is the PSA doubling time rising quickly or slowly? Did they have a worrisome type of uh, uh, profile before the surgery with a high Gleason score, high PSA? I've been very influenced by the power of these new PSMA PET scans. And historically, we've pushed towards earlier is better with radiation. But the quality of the information that we're getting from these scans is so useful. Also, when we have a negative PSMA PET scan, we are somewhat comforted and reassured that you know, cancer isn't blossoming out everywhere and, and, and we're dealing with a highly dangerous situation. It gives us some comfort that, that uh, there's relatively little cancer and it's not visible on a very powerful scan. So I have tended more toward patients uh, rather than immediate uh, implementation of radiation. Uh, also being aware of the fact that if you make someone's incontinence worse or his impotence worse, that that's for the rest of their lives. So while I don't have a fast, hard, stipulated rule that we would always do this or always do that because there are a lot of variables, I do, when in doubt, tend to think more in terms of patients and why don't we wait three to six months, get another PSMA PET scan and, uh, and see if we can find where it is and maybe do more targeted treatment rather than just this blanket coverage of the general area because we don't know where it is. So it sounds like if a patient after having surgery 60 days later has a rising PSA, do they get a PSMA PET scan then to see where the residual area is? And then if it keeps rising, they can keep getting the PSMA PET scans? That's correct. Yes. The follow-up intervals for PSMA PET scans, again, there's no firm hard rule. But what we'll look at, of course, is if you're checking the PSA every three months, which is sort of the typical pro forma, how much, if any, has the PSA risen? If the PSA is very indolent and not changing much, then we would have a longer interval between when we would do the next PSMA PET scan. If the PSA seems to be doubling in short intervals, then we would consider getting another PET scan in, uh, as quickly as maybe within three or four months. Will insurance cover the PSMA PET scan within three or four months? Uh, Medicare certainly does cover uh, PSMA PET scans in anyone with prostate cancer. The private insurances are starting to come along. They were really throwing up barriers to c coverage for PSMA PET scans uh, right after approval in 2022. Uh, we're starting to see a little more uh, reasonable approach now from the private insurance companies. So what do you do in patients, and I know this is kind of a somewhat smaller group, but there are a certain amount of patients that do not respond on a PSMA PET scan. What do you do in those situations, and what is the percentage of patients who would not respond? So by not responding, what you're saying is that there are actually types of prostate cancer that don't make PSMA, and it's thought to be about 10% of men would be in that category. Our usual fallback position is to use another type of PET scan called an Axomen PET scan. It's been around for a while. Pretty good. It's not much use with PSAs under one, and uh, that does limit this decision making in men that have PSAs of 0 0.2, 0 0.4, 0 0.6, because you can do an axiom PET scan and almost certainly you're not going to pick anything up. But if the PSA is starting to get higher, that would be the fallback position. This is part of the challenge of this whole equation is, uh, is a negative PSMA PET scan merely because there's very little disease or is this a small subgroup of men that simply doesn't make PSMA? That has to be kept in the back of our minds. We don't have a perfect answer for how to compensate for that. You know, thankfully, it's not super common, but it can happen.
you know, you're mentioning numbers like 0 0.2, 0 0.5, you know, definitely less than one. I see oftentimes in community practices that after patients have had surgery and they have a rising PSA, the number is usually above one. We see a lot of urologists, you know, kind of waiting for it to rise. What is your advice to patients who are in that category? If patients after surgery or after radiation realize that for the first two years after your treatment, you want to get uh, PSA done every three months. You should be aware of that number. You should track it. You should look uh, if there's an a upward trend. And if your physician isn't advocating further investigation, then I would get a second opinion. I think as patients are doing research, you know, there's a lot of terms that are coming up. And one term that comes up is biochemical recurrence. So what is biochemical recurrence? Is this something to be concerned about? Is it the same thing as a PSA recurrence? What does this mean? It is the same thing as a PSA recurrence. And I think the terminology is rooted in the fact that with other types of cancers, they don't have a PSA, so recurrences in colon cancers and these other things is when a spot shows up on a scan. So that's, that's a material recurrence. I don't know what they call that. But uh, uh, so biochemical just means that it's a, it's a blood test rather than a scan showing a spot. Until PSMA PET scans came along, it was unheard of that you would see something on a scan prior to the PSA, you know, rising up above 5, 10, or 15. So since doctors were not comfortable with waiting till the PSA rose up to 5 or 10 or 15, they were treating not a manifestation of cancer, not a positive scan. They were just treating a number in the blood. I don't use the word biochemical recurrence very much. I think it's uh, somewhat ambiguous, as you pointed out, and, um, but it just means the same thing as a rising PSA. So today we talked about a rising PSA after surgery. Now I understand that this can be a moment where maybe you feel anxiety. You chose surgery to take care of the situation and maybe thought you're hopefully done with it and now your PSA is rising. There's a couple of things I want you to know. First of all, your mental health, your emotional health, all of that matters. So talk to a friend, talk to your medical team and get the support you need because that's very important through this process. Another thing is don't get your PSA tested without getting those results back yourself. Don't get a PSMA PET scan without getting that scan back yourself. First of all, if your PSA is rising and your doctor, you feel like your medical team is letting it rise to one or two, you can get treatment below one. So it's important to know your own numbers, advocate yourself, and if they're not paying attention, maybe get a second opinion or somebody else on your medical team that can help do this with you. Also, please remember that there are other options in the toolbox as far as hormone therapy, chemotherapies, radiation, there are other treatments for this situation, and it's important to know that you have options. If you need help with your specific case, you can contact pcri.org forward slash helpline. We have people who have been in your situation when it comes to prostate cancer and their patients, and they've had high, you know, Gleason scores, and they've had these situations happen, and they can help inform you so that you have a better, better uh, conversation with your medical team. Also, please remember that you're not alone. You can visit our website for more information. Check out our YouTube channel. We have a lot of other videos about this. And the more education you have, the better the outcome. I hope you have a great week.